Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 601. My name is Camden Busey. I serve as the executive director of Reformed Forum here, and uh, we're broadcasting from Grays Lake, Illinois, uh, but this is the second uh, episode. We're broadcasting from our new location, our, our new office, our studio office slash classroom, all under construction and organization at the moment. And I'm delighted to be back with you today. I have with me Elaine Tipton, who serves as professor of systematic theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Glenside, Pennsylvania. He's also pastor of Easton, or Trinity OPC in Easton, uh, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Lane. It's great to speak with you. Camden, as always, it's great to be back. Yeah, we're I'm looking forward to another Voss group. Uh, we're going to have another great conversation today, speaking about the mode of reception of the prophetic revelation. On uh, Voss group, here about once per month on Christ the Center, we take time to work through uh, Voss's book, uh, Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments. We come to uh, chapter four on uh, the mode of reception of the prophetic revelation, which is uh, starting on page 212 in the Banner of Truth edition. Normally I have my old uh, uh, paperback version, but that's still over at the church, and I have with me today uh, the newer uh, hardcover, which is beautiful, the same pagination, except uh, it's just a nicer, much nicer binding. Uh, So I don't have my old notes and whatnot from uh, years past and coffee stains and all that other stuff on my copy, but a nice clean copy today. So I'm a little bit uh, a little bit different, a little bit out of sorts, so not the old uh, familiar standby. But the book itself is the same. We're looking forward to getting through maybe two or three pages of this um, book today. Before we do that, though, we got a couple things to mention, at least um, one big thing. And uh, as of the recording, we just opened registration for our theology conference uh, today. But as of the uh, episode coming out, it should be uh, two days ago. Uh, on uh, July 3rd, a uh, conference registration opened for our 2019 Theology Conference. Uh, this will be our sixth annual conference at Hope OPC in Grays Lake. And uh, we're delighted to, to host again at the church, and we're looking forward to having a lot of people come and visit uh, once more. If you'd like some information about this, we have tried to put everything up to date and everything online, and you can find out information about the conference at reformedforum.org slash conference. That link always updates to whatever uh, our next theology conference is. But now if you visit that link, you'll see all the information. You can register. There are two buttons to register, uh, as well as info on the speakers and the conference topic. Uh, we're focusing the conference this year on on the phrase from Romans seven fourteen, where the law is spiritual. And by that, we're speaking about the New Testament themes about the uh, the law and the spirit as redemptive historical eras. Uh, Lane can attest, and we've spoken of quite a bit on, on Voss Group, about how the Holy Spirit is certainly active in the Old Testament and how the law and what God is doing in terms of his progressive revelation in the Old Testament is not antithetical to what he's doing in the New. And so in a simplistic sense, sometimes people might say that the law and gospel are antithetically opposed or diametrically opposed. Uh, That would be, uh, in in my opinion, a reductionistic and maybe even an irresponsible thing to say. Uh, But if we understand the fullness of God's revelation from old all the way through New Testament, we come to have a much richer view of how the Holy Spirit is bringing in a new era and a new age and working among God's people in an organic way uh, so that we can rightly say that the law is spiritual and has a plan and purpose. And there's even an, uh, an active role for the law in the present life of the believer, though it is redemptive historically different from uh, the, 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 the uh, position, the role it played in the old. Uh, but if you're interested in those kinds of things, if you always had questions about the law and how that works in the life of a Christian, about what Paul's use of the terms law and spirit, flesh, those kinds of things, uh, then you're going to love uh, the conference. We encourage you to come. And if you've come before, uh, the format is is going to be very similar to what we've had in the past. Lane will be speaking, uh, two plenary addresses. I'll be delivering an introduction and a conclusion. We'll also have Jeff Waddington delivering a plenary. And Glenn Clary will be uh, lecturing or speaking at our VIP dinner. This is one of our uh, most uh, fun times. We have the Friday night uh, before the conference begins on uh, October 12th. 
So the Friday night, I believe, is October 11th. Uh, we rent out a pri couple private rooms at Market House on the Square in Lake Forest, Illinois. It's a very nice venue, and we have a, a wonderful dinner, tremendous dinner there available uh, to people who, who register for that particular event. So the VIP dinner, uh, we have a very, very nice dinner. I think this year, Lane, they've changed their menu, so they don't have the flank steak op uh, option anymore, but get this, filet. So filet. Upgrade. <laughs> It's a day. Oh, the flank steak my. was good for a flank steak, but I mean, uh, I think they've got filet now too. So if you're interested in that, I'd like to have a nice oh. filet and we have a wonderful, whatever, an hour long time of uh, fellowship over hors d'oeuvres and uh. some wine and stuff for people that are interested in uh. that. Uh, yeah. I look forward to that. It's one of my high points every year, the VIP dinner, not the whole conference, but the oh, VIP yeah. dinner is, is a tremendous time. Oh, it is. It's a very special we've time. We've also added uh, two things. Uh, we've added a Q&A back in. We, we, we realized we kind of pared some of those down to make room for some of the plenary addresses last year. So what mm -hmm. we've done mm -hmm. is we have three plenary addresses, but we also have an extended uh, question and answer time right after lunch. Also to kind of wake people up, you know, sometimes after lunch you get a little slow. So rather than yeah. listening to a, a, a plenary address uh, after lunch, we're going to have a vibrant Q&A time with the, the speakers and with all the Reform Forum faculty. And also uh, we've added something additional. So another problem, or at least a sticking point we've had, is when the conference ends at about 4.30 p.m. on Saturday, Frequently, you know, a lot of people have to hit the road and want to get home for church the next day, but other people are nearby or they're um, going to be staying through to Sunday. And they often want to, to go have dinner and hang out with each other. And the problem has been that at 5 p.m. On a, on a Saturday night, you're going to go with a large group and just show up at a restaurant. It's hard to find a place where you can all sit together. So what we've done is we've added now a new uh, option where we're going to have a post-conference gathering where we've rented a room at the Vine in Grays Lake, which is another really nice uh, venue, um, restaurant and bar or whatnot. And they have a private room and we've rented that. So if you're interested in coming to a post-conference event, uh, you can get a ticket to that as well. And uh, we'll provide hors d'oeuvres and some basic drinks. But if you'd like to order off of their very full and extensive beer or wine list, uh, there'll be a cash bar. And, and you can order off the full menu as well and order your own dinner there. So that's another option for people that are interested. Uh, certainly not required. You can mix and match and kind of do all of the conference attendee stuff uh, a la carte. So all the information, though, that's a that's a big dump uh, but um, of information. But the the information is all online, reformedforum.org slash conference. I encourage you to register soon. There's an early bird rate going on. I believe the uh, main conference rate is $55, and you'll have plenty of time to, um, to communicate and, and uh, interact with all of our attendees. So it's a real hands-on event, and we'd love for you to be there October 11th through 13th, uh, 2019 at Hope OPC here in Grays Lake. Now, not too far from the Reform Forum office, which has moved out... <laughs> <laughs> of hope OPC to make to make room anyway lane let's uh, get to the biblical theology i'm excited about this as i am every month uh, to speak with you about these topics but as we come really to um chapter well i guess it's not chapter four it might be but it's really section four on page 212 where we've been speaking about the prophets as a redemptive historical era, we now come to a section on the mode of reception of prophetic revelation. So the prophets have received the word of God and they deliver it to God's people. And now we're speaking about how that is to be received by the prophets and then passed on and communicated. This really gets us in some sense into the bread and butter and a, and a real sticking point um, in the church at the time, because Voss is dealing with a lot of modernist uh, theology, which is informed by all sorts of other continental philosophy. And there are all sorts of critical th theories uh, regarding the Bible and prophetism in general. We've been speaking about those in the last few months. Um, what is Voss addressing now when he's speaking about prophetic revelation, and particularly as he's addressing the issue of modernism? Well, Camden, I continue to marvel at the unrelenting passion that Voss has for exposing the errors of modernism by setting modernism over against a robust view of the history of special revelation, the substance of the biblical theology. 
Um, what, what he's doing here, and this is so important for us to spend time on and even do some extra background work on. So just our listeners need to realize we're going to try to open this up and, and get underneath some of the things Voss is presupposing. What he's after, 212, first sentence, is that revelation in its essence is a real communication from Jehovah to the prophets. And, and what he means by real communication is going to be the substance of our whole episode. What is real communication understood in terms of Voss's project of biblical theology? What is real communication understood in terms of the history of special revelation as understood within Reformed theology? And how does that relate to, quote unquote, modernized and subjectivized conceptions of revelation. Here's why I asked the question. Look at the first uh, paragraph. The prophets affirm and imply everywhere a real communication from Jehovah to themselves. They believe themselves recipients of revelation. Now, here's some adjectives. We've just got to spend time with this. In the solid, unmodernized, unsubjectivized and original sense of the word. And, and they're going to therefore set this unmodernized, unsubjectivized, solid and original conception of revelation. They're, what they hold to is going to have to be set in contrast to what is by entailment here, modernized and subjectivized and departs from the solid and departs from the original sense of revelation as these prophets themselves would understand it. And so what he's doing, Camden, and I think our listeners should really appreciate this, is he's setting us up once again, not simply for the promotion of the deeper Protestant conception, but he wants to set that deeper Protestant conception of the reception of prophetic revelation over against modernized and subjectivized alternatives that were dominant in his day and are still, I would say, um, on the dominant side today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really important. And so what then would we say in terms of its essence, what is revelation? Just to remind us. Yeah, yeah. Here's here's what I think we might want to do. Let's 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 keep that just for a moment and let our listeners know what this revelation is not. <laughs> Let, let's let's go by contrast. What does it mean to have a modernized and subjectivized conception of revelation and in terms of which then you modernize and subjectivize what the prophets received? What does that look like? Well, first of all, to have a modernized conception of revelation is to construe history as natural and mechanical in character, natural and mechanic, mechanical. It's fundamentally the same view held by Immanuel Kant and what characterizes all critical conceptions of history. For the modernist, history is encased in patterns of natural cause and effect. And, and history is therefore a closed mechanical reality. Um, the, the mind of man, if you're a Kantian, imposes rational categories of cause and effect um, and other categories as well onto nature. If you're thinking in a more prototypical enlightenment way, the mind simply discovers natural and immutable laws that regulate nature and they don't exhibit any variation. What does that mean? It means that to have a modernized conception of revelation is to have an anti-supernaturalist conception of history. So, so history um, is a kind of brute fact, closed system. And that means that if there's going to be revelation, here's the key. It cannot be supernatural revelation cannot exist in the sphere of natural mechanical history because it would disrupt it. And so the modernists are committed to preserving a purely mechanical, purely closed, non-eschatological, non-supernatural conception of history. And here's the key. 
they have to make their conception of revelation fit with their closed mechanical view of history. So here's the question that our listeners need to understand. What does that view of mechanical closed history, where does it drive you if you're looking for revelation? It drives you away from history. And the second point into a not, not simply modernized, but subjectivized conception of revelation. So to put it just as basically as we know how, if God does not reveal himself in history objectively, then you have to look for any purported revelation in some internal religious disposition, some internal religious intuition. Something in man, in his psychology, is where you look for revelation, but it's not going to be revelation um, that you would understand to be this, God speaking in history. God doesn't speak in history. So to find God or to find revelation, you have to turn inside, kind of like Boltman would say, to faith that is in, in not um, accessible by history, but hidden under it, or hidden within it, or hidden in some depth dimension. Um, so, so Voss is saying, if you turn away from what the prophets believed, here's their, here's their view. They believed they received verbal revelation from God words from God, put in their mouths, put on their pens, committed to, to writing. They believed when they said, thus saith the Lord, they believed they had words from God directly given in history to them. And what the modernists would say is this, no, they'd say, no, God doesn't speak in history. And so wherever you want to find revelation, don't look for words that can be put in a book like the Bible. Look somewhere else. Look in, into the experience of the prophet, some religious depth dimension, but don't look to history and don't look to scripture as a positive, inerrant, verbal revelation from God. And so what, what he's setting us up for here is this, that the prophets do not have a modernized and they do not have a subjectivized, i.e. modernist conception of revelation. It's something entirely different that they believe. So really, it's quite amazing here. In that first paragraph, Voss basically sets us up to see this, that what the scriptures teach about the mode of the reception of prophetic revelation, what the scriptures teach stand in antithetical contrast to modernized and subjectivized critical conceptions of history and ideas of revelation that are not covenant historical. It's, it's really important that we recognize that from the outset. Once again, Voss draws a fundamental uh, and categorical antithesis between the history of special revelation, deeper Protestant conception, and the history of religious experience, the deeper modernist conception. Voss definitely then presenting a different idea, a different conception about uh, what is going on here. And he speaks about a real communication of God unto his people, namely to the prophets. So what does he mean by that, then, real communication? Uh, it's not just some intuition now, the prophets have. It's not just a, a, a response the prophets are making as a critical subject to the phenomena of the world, but something that is communicated to them by a person, by a triune person from outside uh, the realm of the natural. Yeah, yeah. Here's the here's the um, the adjective I want us to look at. We're still in the first paragraph. We're 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 moving at lightning <laughs> pace today. Typical. But fashion. Um, in the first paragraph, notice this. He he says, instead standing over against unmodernized, unsubjectivized, standing over against the modernist and the subjective is what the solid and the original sense of the word, the original sense. Note this in terms of of what Voss is after. What when Voss talks about the original notion of real communication from Jehovah, ask our listeners this, where does your mind go in the biblical theology to find original revelation, original real communication from Jehovah? Your mind goes back immediately to where? To the pre-fall environment in Eden. 
And so we need to think back in the biblical theology to the pre-fall situation where we need to recall um, that in the original sense of the term, we have to think of two fundamental categories. We have to think of Adam created as the image of God, and we have to think of voluntary condescension in covenant that addresses Adam as the image of God. When we think of Revelation in its original covenant historical sense, we, we need to make a distinction here, and I think this is very useful. Voss makes this distinction, Bavink makes it, Van Til makes it. It really helps set Reformed theology over against not just modernism, but Roman Catholicism on this point. Uh, but here's the point. When Adam was created, thinking back to the, the biblical theology early chapter, he was created as the image of God. And in terms of natural or general revelation, he knew God. Put it differently, he had a natural knowledge of God that was conferred upon him in the act of image endowment. Now, it's just that image bearer who knows God by nature that the Westminster standards say God voluntarily condescended in covenant to give Adam in his natural obedience, to give him through covenant, the possibility of fruition of God as blessedness and reward. Creation then brings into view natural knowledge of God, concreated, the census divinitatis, and voluntary condescension brings into view covenantal knowledge of God. The former is given by way of creation, the latter by way of voluntary condescension. And, and here's the formula. This is the formula for our listeners to understand. This is the deeper Protestant conception in a nutshell. The natural without the covenantal is blind. It cannot come to fruition. It cannot advance a state. But the covenantal without the natural is empty. Uh, the covenant do, uh, doesn't address anything unless it addresses Adam as image of God, naturally knowing God. So when you think back to Adam in Eden, and you ask the question, what is the Reformed view of a real communication from God to Adam in the original setting of Eden prior to the fall? In other words, if we're good biblical theologians, what does that look like? Well, here's what it looks like. Under the covenant of works, God gave to image-bearing Adam a real communication from himself directly in history that consists in positive verbal revelation. And so from the outset, even though Adam knew God naturally, the census divinitatis, the the, the requirements of God were stamped onto Adam's being. He was in natural religious fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. But in that context, and Canon, this is something we can uh, develop in light of texts like Westminster Confession 7.1, Westminster Shorter Catechism 12, what does God do? He gives positive verbal revelation, inerrant and authoritative, to Adam regarding the path for advancing that natural fellowship to glory. And so in an act of voluntary condescension, there is in history a God-breathed word that bears directly on image-bearing Adam and binds him to perfect, personal, exact, and entire obedience. It's a covenantal word. I think Voss wants us to recognize that such is the case as the quote-unquote original real communication from God. And what I think he's setting us up for is that liberalism, modernism, cannot affirm this at any point. In fact, builds its entire system trying to replace this with something else. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's tremendous to think of just the architectonic differences uh, between Voss and between the modernists and liberals, but also between yeah. Voss as a Reformed theologian developing this heightened covenantal theology and uh, those who might present, um, you know, various forms of a nature-grace dualism 
or distinction yes. and separation. The covenant is essential, yes. and God's communication, even prior to the fall to sin, is important and essential unto the relationship uh, with his image, humankind. Yes, it, it, it is. And let me explain exactly how it is. This is critical. Um, by the way, what we're about to discuss, Bavink, um, Voss, Van Til, this would be them over against Rome and over against modernism at this particular point. But let, let's talk about that for just a second, um, because I, I think um, this is this as a side point is useful when you think about Van Til. Um, the natural knowledge of God was given to Adam as an image bearer. Um, and this is something that is implanted in him. Knowledge is given in image endowment. Now, Roman Catholics, as well as modernists, of course, they deny original natural fellowship with God. Um, for for the, the liberal, there's no um, concern about an historical before and after from innocency to sin and misery. Bart denies it, and in varying ways, all forms of liberal theology deny the imputation and transmission of sin. Uh, it's Pelagian. Um, but Roman Catholicism also, remember, denies natural religious fellowship, natural knowledge of God that consists in fellowship. And um, the Reformed affirm that using the language of the census divinitatis, but that natural knowledge of God that coincides with being an image bearer cannot reach fruition as merely natural. In other words, Adam owes God everything as a creature. And what does God owe Adam for his obedience, natural obedience? Nothing. He owes him nothing. Adam is a claimless creature of the dust by nature. But God does not leave Adam in his natural state. Genesis 2-7 instantly transitions to Genesis 2-8 and the placement of Adam in the Garden of Eden and brings to bear on him in an act of special providence the voluntary condescension of covenant. And what is the essence of that voluntary condescension? It is this. It is a positive, special, verbal revelation from God. Inerrant, carrying the very authority of God in the very words that come from God himself, offering him what? Offering him the fruition of that natural religious fellowship as it climaxes through covenantal obedience. Covenant is the means to the end of bringing the natural religious fellowship with God in Eden to its eschatological climax. See, this is foundational to everything we hold dear as Reformed theologians. So the covenant confers on Adam's natural obedience that which can consummate. It can't consummate by nature, but it can consummate by an act of special providence called covenant. And, and the point that starts to um, show the difference with the modernists is this, that the word that God gives that directs obedient Adam to consummation in heaven with God in the, in the fruition of the fellowship bond, that is, an, that is a word from God given in history directly to Adam binding him to perfect personal exact and entire obedience under the threat of death for disobedience, Sabbath rest and glory and life for obedience. See, th th in other words, the, the, what you think about the mode of reception of prophetic revelation is going to be determined by whether or not you believe in the mode of Adam's reception of revelation in Eden consisting in a divinely spoken, positive, authoritative word. Uh, it's, it's, it's that that I think Voss is saying the prophets are presupposing. So let me put this in a broader context. To, to put it in the context of scripture, the prophets believe themselves when they say, thus saith the Lord. They believe themselves. Their witness is indisputable. Even the critics acknowledge they believe this. Um, but they believe that they are receiving divinely communicated positive words from God 
in a manner analogous to the way that Adam received such words directly from God prior to the fall. There's a seamless continuity between the prophetic reception of the words from God and the giving of those words to Adam before the fall and now the giving of those words to the prophets after fall. There's a there's an organic continuity between the special revelation pre-fall and the special revelation post-fall. And that continuity in part is that these are words given directly by God to prophets, um, to image bearers in history. And it's this that all modernists deny. Every single modernist denies this. And Voss is saying this is quintessential to original, solid revelation when you're thinking about the prophets and you're thinking about their, their understanding of how the pre-fall situation bears on the nature of the revelation they're receiving. Mm -hmm. Really important. Yeah. Point. That organic, uh, that organic connection and relationship needs to be expressed and we can look at it also from another angle and you can see the organic relationship, uh, between, uh, God's revelation, both, externally through his word, but also internally to man as created in God's image. So there's a connection, a deep connection in Voss between nature and covenant in this way, which I think uh, has a lot to say about Voss's insistence that there is pre-redemptive special revelation. I, th I think that's important. I mean, we do call it a special act of providence by which uh, God communicates um, his blessings to his people and how they may come to have a fruition of God as their blessedness and reward. But we, we ought not to think of man being created in God's image in some mode where he is intended to live and exist apart from this real <laughs> communication, right? Oh. And, and, and that's where we start yes. to get into a host of issues which morph and, and you know, transform into all sorts of other theological permutations. Voss is helpful to get, to get our minds clear in these first chapters of the Bible and the very beginnings of history itself so that we have these foundations for, a, for an understanding of the entire scripture and the entire Bible and the entire history of humankind and, and uh, covenant history for that matter. It, yes, Camden. And just to, to build on that, let me remind everyone of something that might be useful. When you're talking about a real communication from God in the, in the solid and, um, and um, original sense of the term, um, let me apply. Let, uh, I, I'm not sure if our listeners are aware of this, but Van Til is just an, um, uh, a Klein, Gaffin, Van Til, heirs of Voss. That's the right. best way to understand mm -hmm. them. Um, let me give you an example of Van Til as an heir of Voss and an heir of the Reformed tradition on this. I'm not sure many people know about it, um, but but Van Til's work that that um, you and Jim and others uh, talked about, nature and scripture, yeah. the the work that he did uh, it was in the Infallible Word, mm -hmm. and then I think it reappeared as a preface to Warfield's Inspiration Authority of the Bible. Listen to this. Van Til wants to affirm uh, of natural or general revelation, that it is necessary, sufficient, perspicuous, and authoritative for its purpose of giving man natural communion with God in a fellowship bond in Eden. Now, among other things, after the fall, it has a different function that, that brings into view judgment. But pre-fall, natural or general revelation, that is, Adam created in the image of God, is in a natural religious bond of fellowship with God and the natural or general revelation in him and outside of him is necessary, sufficient, perspicuous, and authoritative for the purpose of that relation. But what we could call now in light of Westminster Confession 7.1 and Westminster Confession 12, uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism 12, providential special revelation, that is voluntary condescension we call a covenant, that itself is necessary, sufficient, perspicuous, and authoritative for what purpose? For giving Adam the prospect and means now to advance that natural religious fellowship bond to its consummation, yeah. to its fruition. And so, the the two points is uh, the two points relate in this way: that the natural general revelation, without providential special revelation though it's sufficient in itself, is insufficient by itself. 
See, it's it's sufficient for its own purpose, but the purpose is not to advance Adam beyond probation. Hence, there needs to be a providential special revelation in covenantal condescension that is necessary, sufficient, clear, and authoritative for advancing that natural relation. And so our point, and I, I think Camden, maybe this will help, and we can try to keep putting it in, in a, ways that are ascendingly clear, always trying mm-hmm. to aim for greater clarity. Right. But the natural general without the special providential, once again, is what? It's blind. The special providential uh, without the natural general is, um, is empty. And so it's best to think of these two aspects of God relating to his people as distinct. One is the order of creation. One is the order of of special providence. They're distinct, but they're also inseparable. The one is not given without the other. And I think we should push toward a conception of simultaneity. That is, no sooner is Adam formed in natural religious fellowship than God speaks to him covenantally. Uh, no sooner has God spoken to Adam than he's spoken to him as formed from the dust of the ground so that so that these two aspects of natural and general revelation on the one side, providential special revelation on the other side, they're distinct in terms of their economies, creation and special providence, but they're inseparably synchronous in their uh, operation toward Adam. And when you recognize that, you can avoid the whole problem of nature-grace dualism, where nature's designed to function on its own, as per historic Roman Catholicism. It's designed to function on its own without positive special verbal revelation, um, a kind of um, self-sufficiency that is not found in this deeper Protestant conception. So uh, different conceptions of nature have different conceptions of what addresses nature. Rome's conception of nature is one thing. The modernist conception is another thing. But neither the Roman Catholic nor the modernist notion of nature um, and history fit with the Reformed. And so as as you back out and look at what Voss is doing here, it's just this conception, what we've just talked about. Now, Voss didn't include this. We did it to amplify for our listeners. We, we admit that. But this solid original conception of revelation, it's that conception that Voss everywhere presupposes. And it's that conception of original revelation that the modernist critics are denying, whether it's Cunin. Uh, on page uh, 213 and 214, whether it's the kernel revelation theory, we'll have to treat another time, or whether it's the divination theory, here's here's where he's going. And Camden, I have a feeling we're probably um, not going to be able to deal with as much detail as we'd like to <laughs> on the theories yet. We're getting there. We're, we've kind of prefaced it. But, um, but here's Voss's point. If you don't believe in what the prophets themselves claim they've received, the Reformed believe it, the modernists don't because they have a different view of history, a different view of revelation, different view of nature. Everything's uh, fundamentally different. It's Kantian, not Vossian, if I could put it that basically. It's Kantian, not Vossian. So if you take a Kantian modernist route, the, the way that you're going to explain revelation and especially the way you're going to understand the prophet's own understanding of receiving that revelation and the way you assess it, it's going to be guided by a host of presuppositions and a host of categories that are going to have that are going to force you to come up with an alternative. Because here, here's the simple reformed answer to this question. What is the mode of reception of the prophetic revelation? They received words from God directly in history. That's the simplest way to put it. Now, we can make that more sophisticated and more nuanced as we look at the modalities involved. We'll, we'll make it more sophisticated. But the essence is they re- just as Adam received inerrant, verbal, positive revelation from God in Eden, so these prophets are receiving the same in a post-fall environment. And now the question is, okay, if your philosophy of history can't allow that, and the modernists can't, can't because they're following Kant. Right. What alternative will you advance? Well, Voss's whole point is that the modernist alternatives are rooted in expressing a different philosophy of history and a different view of the God-world relation. And so um, 
putting it this way helps us, I think, get to the methodological and theological heart of the antithesis that always remains between, to put it this way, the Kantians and those after the deeper modernist conception and Vossians, those after the deeper Protestant or reformed conception. He's really helping us see once again that what you think about revelation is going to be determined by whether you're a naturalist, mechanical Kantian or post-Kantian, or whether you believe in a history of supernatural organic special revelation. Um, if you deny the latter, you're going to be forced to make your theories of, of prophetic reception of revelation fit with an alien Kantian modernist philosophy of history and conception of God. And I think Voss, once again, is masterful in, in giving us this upfront and not, not suspending the differences in order to try to have some objective discussion about what's historical and what's reliable. Uh, and we, we may get into it next time, but um, you know, what you believe about the nature of history and the nature of the God who reveals himself is going to determine what you say about prophecy's fulfillment and the conditions for its oh, fulfillment. Oh, sure. Right. It's, it's astounding, yeah. Yeah, Voss, it's at least it worth, I think, opening up uh, some of the basic elements that Voss lists on the top of 213. Uh, yeah. We're not going to be able to get to Kunin, uh this month, but we hope to uh, very certainly next month and, and do it with a with great some great depth. But uh, Voss does say there are three elements entering into the problem to be solved. Uh, the first is the psychological fact of the conviction on the part of the prophets. Everyone seems to recognize this. It's very few, even critical scholars, would say that the prophets didn't think that they received the word of God. They'd have different mm -hmm. reasons for why. Maybe they're on drugs or something, hallucinating. But then the second is the continuity of the prophetic movement with its claim to supernaturalism during so many oh, yeah. centuries. So this isn't just a one-off thing, but it's a claim that has remained steady throughout many, many years and many different prophets in many different regions, all people worshiping Yahweh. The third is the remarkable body of predictions that has accompanied the movement in its course, the whole teleological trend of it towards a distant consummation, in point of which no movement in the history of religions can be compared with it. So what, what's the setting in which we should understand these, not just a bare kind of rationalistic evidentiary approach to these yeah. things, but how, how yeah. is it helpful the way Voss describes it and how, how ought we to well, interpret that and yeah. receive it without misunderstanding the point he's making? Yeah, this is fascinating. I'm so glad we got to this, Kevin. I was wanting to get there. You got us right to it. So thank you, uh, as always, for leading uh, the discussion so well. Um, here's what Voss is saying. Th these critics, you got to remember, they're anti-supernaturalist. They're rationalist. But they don't want to be utterly dismissive of everything the prophets say. And so they've got to find a way to account for two phenomena. Here's, here's the key. I'm trying to focus it so we're all on point for next time. Uh, on the one side, the critics want to recognize, point one, that, that the prophet psychologically, they really did seem to think that they spoke with divine authority. At bare minimum, they thought, what mm -hmm. I'm saying Certainly. comes from God. Right. But as, as um, uh, Cunan and others are going to make clear, they were mistaken about that. And, and, and so what, you're, what you're, you're going to see here is an anti-supernaturalist rationalism of a soft variety. The hard variety would say, we know that God doesn't speak in history. Kant has shown us that practical reason is, is going to access noumenal realities. Theoretical reason, the kind of reason we apply to history, can't even get you to religion. So, you know, real crass, strong, philosophically self-conscious modernists are just going to dismiss the possibility of verbal revelation altogether. Um, these, this brand of modernism is a little bit more sophisticated, and here's what they're going to do. They're going to say, look, let's be naturalistic, but let's look at the psychology of the prophets. What were the prophets wanting when they were speaking? Now, we're, we're not, I don't want to spoil Cunin's point, but what you have to do is you have to say, instead of dismissing them 
with our anti-supernaturalist rationalism. Let's try to understand, now here's the key, their human and political motivation, their Zetzenleben, their, their, their life setting. Let's try to understand their own religious, political, personal motivation for making such a grand claim. And when we do that, maybe we'll find that they had a certain political motive to have as much authority as they could have so that they might be maximally influential and revered. And so you can already see that the shift for the liberal, this psychological move now, this studying their psychology, we're going to invest the prophet's self-understanding with categories derived from psychological right. studies of that time that domesticate and naturalize the phenomenon. So right. we're not going to look at exactly how it happens, but the whole point is that psychology is going to be used now to domesticate, naturalize, and modernize the prophets and explain their claim by a very different paradigm and a very different set of assumptions. So it'll be very mm -hmm. interesting to look at these in some detail. Yeah, we'll look forward to doing that uh, next month, next episode. Uh, hopefully, first week of August, uh, we can come back and address uh, the remaining portions of, of this argument and pick back up on page 213 of Voss's book, Biblical Theology. Uh, before we, we go, Lane, though, when, when I think of, you know, motivation, prophetic motivations, and I think of, you know, the, the modernist uh, psychological approach and how the prophets might have been, you know, maximally or desiring to maximize their political influence and power. And you think of a guy like Jeremiah, that's, that's the first thing I think of with Jeremiah. <laughs> You know, yes. man, Jeremiah, you know, he, he wasn't a young man just minding his own business at all. No, he he had a plan and a purpose to go forth yeah. to the to the world's leaders and, and try to exert his political power. <laughs> I mean, isn't it something? It is. You know, Voss has a line. We'll look at it later where these prophets surely start to look like the critics. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Wanting all this academic influence well, and yeah, reputation and so for on. Sure. But in their case, it was a little more political. Yeah. But um, yeah, Camden, it, here's the thing. as We're going to be able to, to, to do some internal critiques of this. But I think uh, Jeremiah being a, a great paradigm of this, the, the, the very thing that there's wanting to say the prophets are after are precisely the things the prophets call out kings and false prophets for doing. Yeah. We'll, we'll look at this later, I but know. I mean, the prophets are the most anti-pragmatic pains in the sides of kings and other false prophets. Why? Because they're not motivated by political gain. They're not promoting their own agendas. They're not trying to gain a reputation or following. They're being unrelentingly right. faithful to the self-revelation of God. The things they're saying are not in their best interest from a from a worldly they're perspective not. at all. That's exactly right. They're, in fact, if you're a politician, I guarantee you there are much more politically savvy ways to go about it than say, hey, thus saith the Lord, due to your idolatry and rebellion, you are going to be sent in exile because you have despised the things of the right. Lord. Repent, you know, the covenant lawsuit structure. Uh, that that is not how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> but you know what it is? It's the way of faithfulness to the Lord. Humble boldness. Why? Because God has spoken an inerrant, infallible, authoritative, self-evidencing word that has been committed to the prophetic and apostolic scriptures, to the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. And, um, and as such, you see, we as ministers of the word, are to be bound by the same conviction of the prophets and to follow those words breathed out once for all by God and to do it in a way that does not aspire for influence or a hearing, but aspires for faithfulness and ultimately to serve the church and honor the word, the God-breathed word of the ascended Amen. Christ. Yeah, that's a wonderful way to end. I appreciate that, Wayne. And We'll seek to continue that and uh, to learn more from, from God's servant, uh, Gerhardus Voss, here as we open up next time at page 213 of Voss's book, uh, Biblical Theology, 
Old and New Testaments. Looking forward to that. Uh, of course, you can find out information about everything we're up to. I'm working hard now full-time for Reform Forum. I've always been working hard, but now a lot of my uh, time and effort are, are focused in um, trying to trying to do some things that we've been putting off for many years and uh, trying to get everything up to speed. So um, stay tuned to the website. We hope to have some improvements there. And uh, also uh, very much looking forward to our, our Wimberley seminar coming out on video uh, in the fall. We've been hard at work on that, providing some production notes to the video crew and adjusting a few things, uh, doing you know various things here and there to get that ready. And we're going to do a test run of it at Hope OPC. If you'd like to come and watch uh, July 7th, I think the first one they'll be doing um, you can pop on over and watch a kind of a pilot version of it. Uh, and, uh, we're going to be doing that for 12 weeks and, uh, hopefully in the fall, it'll be available for everybody. And, uh, also on, uh, July 21st, I believe it is. If there's anybody out in Ohio, I'll, I'll be uh, preaching at Redeemer, uh, PCA in Hudson, Ohio. And I believe it's the 20th, uh, Saturday, the 20th, uh, we're going to be hosting, kind of a reform forum open house, kind of a get together. Well, I'll be there um, at uh, the home of one of our board members uh, and uh, he's in Hudson, Ohio. So if you'd like to attend that, you're in, you're in the Clevelandish area or anywhere near Ohio or would like to drive there or get there, uh, let me know. Uh, we hope to have an event uh, going on uh, about 6 p.m., I think, Eastern time. If I don't have the dates and the info in front of me, and Mark's going to be on my case for not having that written down. It's in the other room. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll have some emails out and uh, and hope to get in touch with everybody. And I hope I get to meet uh, many of you who aren't able to come to our conference or other events. We'd like to stay in touch with you this way. If you got any questions, of course, you can send us an email mail at reformedforum.org. You can call us. Got a new phone number on the uh, website, the bottom of the website. You can call the office and I've uh, got voicemail. I'll try to pick up if it's a real person and not a robocall. Um, so a lot of adjustments, a lot of exciting things going on here. But of course, uh, we continue doing those things we love to do. Uh, and that is to talk about our Lord, to talk about his word and the theology, the system of doctrine that uh, his word contains. So thanks so much, uh, Lane, for uh, for taking the time this month. And uh, thank you, the listener, for joining us. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.